Hi, I'm AJ Lewis. Welcome to UCLA Next. On this edition, we'll be giving our set a makeover, something you won't want to miss, so stay tuned. Welcome to UCLA Next. We gave Yvonne Miles and Susan some time off because we needed to bring in an outside artist. Hi. This is Anthony Macchio to all of you out there. And as you may know, this is a student-produced shoot at UCLA. We have no money at UCLA. So we decided we wanted to make our set look professional. Now, Anthony is an art director, has done... How many press junkets have you done in your career? Oh, uh, hundreds. Hundreds. So we thought we'd, you know, use his talent to help us spice things up a little bit. Now, Anthony, what do you see as the major problem with what we like to call our set? Uh, lighting. Uh, depth. Uh, these, these stairs aren't doing it for you. Not so quite. Much. And, and the paint cans, you think maybe? Uh, a little, a little desperate. Uh, we'll start with a black ground, what we call limbo, okay. which is always good when you don't have money to go with a black ground. A limbo? Uh, a limbo look, and some clean and simple furnishings along with some donated stuff that we have left over. All right, so Anthony, <laughs> there, there's still a lot of work yet to be done. Yeah, there's, but you guys will get it done. Uh, okay. You, you know, we well, want to construct these these panels okay. into a uh, like a dressing screen in the background. Right. I've laid out some plans, so that's your homework for when I come back. What do you mean? So here we are, 48 hours later. Anthony, tell us, did you accomplish your goal? Um, pretty close. I think we've come. I think we've come a long way. We've fixed our lighting. We adjusted our cameras. We've got some more depth and color, and I think everybody's looking a little better. It's a little bit more funky. We've got the leather going on, and, yeah, and we're, uh, we're kind some of cute flowers. Well, and uh, thank you, I gotta, I gotta say, I love this screen behind us. That was, that was a really nice touch. Yeah, it works. Well, you <laughs> mentioned off-camera VH1. Do you, do you think we've even approached? Seven, six. We approach VH1 on a bad day, <laughs> which is better than what Which we is had. what we strive to do here. <laughs> Anthony, my, my, my pleasure. Thank you so much my for being, being with us. And uh, Yvonne, Susan, Miles, to you. Welcome to a very special edition of UCLA Next. I'm Susan O. I'm Miles Gregory. And I'm Yvonne De La Rosa. And this is our brand new set. I'm so excited. I couldn't even say my name. Styling, huh? Kind of a mod squad thing. I'm Omar Epps. We like to redecorate from time to time, make a statement about who we are and what we do. All I know is I've been begging for better lighting to highlight my beautiful skin tone and flatter my natural curly hair. You like? You know what? Now that I really think of it, I've never gotten a really good look of you before. Me neither. You're not that bad looking. Yes, I do know. Well, anyways, moving on with the show, we've got a whole lot going on today. Right. Let's start with Team Scientific and a look at the UCLA Observatory and Telescope with our very own astrophysicist, Professor Matt Malkin. Primarily a teaching telescope for educational purposes. Because of the location and the small size of the telescope, 14 inches, it, it's not nearly so powerful. It is, of course, much more powerful than the telescopes that famous astronomers like Galileo and Herschel and so on had when a lot of things were learned about our galaxy and our universe. Since this is a computer-controlled telescope, the first thing we have to do is to locate a reference point. And the best reference point in the sky is Polaris, the North Star. 
the first thing that we have to do is to turn on the power to the telescope and then tell it to go find the North Star. When it's really locked on precisely to the direction of the North Star, the computer should be able to move the telescope to find any other object in the sky that's in its memory. The second thing it has to do is it has to uh, calibrate, it has to check its astronomical clock very accurately because you're never going to find anything in the sky unless you know exactly what the astronomical time is or you'll be off too far to the east or the west. So the second thing after we figured out exactly where due north is, we're going to go look at another very bright star to make sure that the clock is within a second of precisely accurate to keep track of star time. You can quite easily see some of the nearest galaxies in this telescope, and even the nearest galaxies are so far away that we're not looking at their light now as they are today. We're looking at how they were tens of millions of years ago before there were any human beings, for example. Now we're looking in one particular direction. After we point the telescope where we want to look, we'll rotate the whole building around until the telescope lines up with the dome opening. Okay. Somewhat unusual for an entire dome building to rotate. Some of the modern telescopes with very large buildings have put a big part of the building on a, a wheeled track, usually just the top round hemispheric part of the dome rotate. 34 degrees north of the equator, a little more than 34, and 118 degrees, so that means a little more than nine hours west of Greenwich. So here we are at the UCLA Planetarium, and the entranceway has this slightly curious shape because it's specially designed to trap the light and keep it out so that people who are sitting in almost complete darkness here don't have their eyes and their dark adaptation blasted when some latecomer opens the door. We're going to get a star show, and our host for this evening is Erin Smith, who is a new graduate student working on her PhD in astronomy at UCLA. Um, I actually have been interested in astronomy since I can remember. Uh, when I was, you know, when you go outside and you look up at the stars and, you know, you ask mom and dad, what are those things going up in the sky? Uh, you know, the parents give the nice road answer of, oh, they're God's candles or, you know, they're fi fireflies or something like that. I never really accepted those answers. I can remember actually giving my parents a lecture on that stars weren't God's candles. They were big balls of gas filled with high dragon. Well, I went to uh, University of Texas in Austin for my undergrad degree, and there I got interested in instrumentation, which is basically building instruments that go onto telescopes so that you can do science with them. And uh, my advisor told me that UCLA was one of the best places to do instrumentation. I visited here, and I love the department, so I came here. I mean, this is a great uh, astronomy program, and so we have great facilities, and great people. You need all of those things if you really want to be working on exciting frontline research. And it's pretty impressive to look with this telescope at objects that really form shortly after the Big Bang. Point Now that Griffith Observatory, which is was, has been probably the most single popular place on the planet for people looking through a telescope, it's shut down for this massive renovation that won't be finished in 2005. So if you're in the Los Angeles area, as far as I know, on a regular weekly basis, this is about the only telescope of fairly decent power uh, that's set up for anybody in the general public to walk in and look at some interesting things in the sky. You can just come by any Wednesday night if it's clear. You can't do much if it's uh, overcast. But if it's clear, then during the, the term, every clear Wednesday, there should be a UCLA astronomer here showing people interesting things through the telescope. The most important thing, once you figure out how to get here, the top of the Mass Sciences Building, is to make sure and look outside before you hop in your car to make sure that you can see some blue sky as the sun is going down. Romantica. Now I know where to take my Wednesday night girlfriend. <laughs> you assign the nights. How's the dude supposed to keep uh, you know, the schedule out straight? <laughs> you know what I mean? Excuse me. 
didn't you try to get me to go see a movie with you last Wednesday night? And then I said something like I had to wash my hair or pour scalding hot oil all over myself. Well, I may have had a cancellation. Uh, uh, you know what we could do tonight? Uh, take a second look at Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove. Another uh, cancellation? That's Miles. Dr. Strangelove. Yes. Oh, it's love. Yes. Something you know nothing about. Know a lot about the glove. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have a very rich fantasy life, don't you, Miles? Like butter. Why are you talking like that? <laughs> Hello, I'm Bob Rosen, Dean of UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, welcoming you to A Second Look at the Movies an invitation to see a film from the past that has particular resonance with the present. Despite the legendary status of Dr. Strangelove as perhaps the greatest political satire on film of all time, I've been surprised to discover that many younger audiences have never actually seen it. I have, maybe a dozen times, but viewing it recently in a contemporary context made it a totally fresh experience. With issues of war and peace, weapons of mass destruction, and the fight against evil foes much on our mind, and with the heightened need to think our way through these issues clearly, Dr. Strangelove has disturbingly heightened relevance. It belabors the obvious to list the many virtues of director Stanley Kubrick's masterwork as an example of film art at its best. The black, black humor of Kubrick and Terry Southern's scabrous and brilliantly written script. The extraordinary performance, or should I say performances, of Peter Sellers in three radically different roles. Colonel Lionel Mandrake, a coolly rational English military officer who simply can't believe that a crazed American general could deliberately start a nuclear war. Merkin Muffley, a well-intentioned but weak American president who hasn't the foggiest idea how to stop it, and most unforgettably of all, Dr. Strangelove himself, a sadistically twisted scientific advisor who sees in the catastrophe a golden opportunity to realize the dreams of his Nazi youth. Complimenting Sellers are other memorable performances by Sterling Hayden as Air Force General Jack D. Ripper, a totally mad military officer whose defiantly erect cigar belies an acute deficit of precious bodily fluids. And George C. Scott is General Buck Turgidson, the bombastic leader of American forces whose bodily fluids are apparently just fine, but who is also ready to zap the Ruskies. And in the role of his career, Slim Pickens is a down-home country boy turned bomber pilot who dons a Stetson to straddle an A-bomb like a bucking bronco and ride it down to earth in his own destruction, and incidentally, all the rest of humanity as well. But above all else, what struck home most on my recent viewing of Strange Love was its dominant theme the double bind of trying to make rational decisions in solving potentially lethal conflicts where the basic premises that everyone accepts are so crazy that rational conclusions really are impossible. If, by definition, your opponent is depicted as an irretrievably duplicitous embodiment of evil set on destroying you no matter what you say or do, well, it would seem that rational interchange is useless. If you buy into fancy military technologies and computerized software as more reliable and more objective than human decision making, pretty soon the will of the machines will take precedence over the will of their creators. If you believe that a massive preemptive military strike is the only way to take on a corrupt opponent, you just may foreclose the possibility that if you played it right, the corruption itself could bring about his downfall. And most of all, when you open the door to believing that we can actually use nuclear weapons and can actually survive a nuclear war, you open the door to thinking the unthinkable. How best to carry it out? Admittedly, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, is a comedy, an extremely funny comedy at that. 
but it's a comedy with a deadly disturbing and sobering perspective on the world. And admittedly, the world of 1964, when the film first came out during the Cold War, was a radically different place from today. But you know, somehow I have to admit that its message strikes home. For me at least, and maybe for you, it's the perfect film for a second look. Quick test. What's the longitude of UCLA? Mm, 118. Latitude? 34. Ladies, I'm impressed with your ability to listen and retain. Well, it so happens I weigh 118 mm. in lead boots. Mm. That is. And 34 is one of my measurements. I'll let you guess which. And now for our cover story, a highly exciting advancement in the field of medicine taking place right here on campus. UCLA researchers have made tremendous strides in developing an artificial liver offering new hope for thousands of transplant candidates. They're using the body's own stem cell technology and tissue engineering. Let's take a look. <laughs> Let's take a look. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> Hi, we are in front of McDonald Medical Research Laboratories at UCLA. We are going to meet with Dr. Beck Dixit. He's going to talk to us about his research on the artificial livers and stem cell technology used to generate them. Living on my friend. What kind of research do we do in here? Well, the type of research that we're doing here uh, pertains to um, liver disease. And we are looking at uh, different strategies to treat different types of liver disease. Uh, liver disease is not a uniform disease that if you have liver disease, there's only one treatment. There are many types of liver diseases that require many types of treatments. And so we are looking at a variety of uh, liver diseases, and we've classified them as uh, liver disease that require immediate attention or acute liver failure or liver injury. And then we have uh, long-term liver injury like cirrhosis where uh, the disease lasts for many, many years. So how can we improve the quality of life of these patients? What is the need for this research? Do we not already have transplant in use? Uh, liver transplantation is the, uh, I guess, the ultimate treatment for a person with very severe liver disease, regardless of whether it's a chronic or an acute liver disease. Liver transplantation is the gold standard that if you have a liver transplantation, you literally have a new liver. But not everyone is able to get a liver transplant because liver transplant uh, is not only an expensive procedure, but uh, we have to judiciously apply liver transplantation to the population of people with liver disease. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that there's a, a shortage of donor organs that are available for transplantation. One of the types of research that we are doing here is to develop treatments that will help these patients who are unable to get a transplant. Um, a way to stabilize these patients, maybe improve their quality of life, uh, buy time so that uh, we can uh, wait for a liver transplant to become available or in, in some cases, actually a very small number of cases, uh, these patients can be treated with such a device so that no liver transplant would be necessary. So that's one type of research that we're doing and that research involves the uh, development and uh, testing of a bio-artificial liver support system. And this system is an uh, extracorporeal or outside the body type of system. Uh, so there's a long-term uh, research that we are doing. Uh, concurrently, we are also looking at how to solve the immediate problems. Uh, there are many types of bioartificial liver that people have proposed, and we are testing one of those types of bioartificial liver uh, in which um, animals uh, the, have been subjected to liver failure, and the liver failure can be characterized in a certain way that it, it represents a human condition. And um, what we will do is uh, we will uh, connect the bioartificial liver 
to the diseased animal, a large diseased animal, so that we can uh, test the efficacy of this uh, treatment. Why do you use pigs uh, in your research? Pigs are uh, unique in that um, pigs very closely resemble the human being. And um, so they are the most suitable animals. They're also large enough. We need animals that are large enough to, uh, to, to mimic the human condition because we are taking many samples and we, are, uh, we want to treat them the same way as we treat human beings. Some animals will receive treatment and some animals will not receive treatment. And this way we can compare uh, uh, the efficacy of treatment. We, we do a statistical analysis to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt that the effects that we are seeing are due to the treatment that we are applying. Well, the next step, tissue engineering, which essentially involves the development of uh, uh, biomaterials on which cells can be grown. But in tissue engineering, we are trying to create new tissue that can be transplanted or used to support uh, a patient. And rather than using stem cells from uh, fetuses or uh, from, uh, uh, from sources that are uh, controversial, we are trying to use the body's own stem cells because the body has a very large supply of stem cells. You, uh, you can have signals to home these signals, uh, these cells to a particular site and produce new liver tissue. It takes almost uh, eight to nine months, sometimes a year, to make new liver tissue. And if you have a very serious condition, that may be a very long time. So we're looking at techniques now to improve the uh, formation of this tissue and make this tissue form in a much shorter period of time. Yeah, at least 15 to 20 years is, uh, is what uh, it'll take for tissue engineering to reach the clinical workspace. Wow. I feel sad for the piggies. I never knew they were so much like people. Oh, you never met my Wednesday night girlfriend. Cute, but a bit of an oinker. You know what I'm saying? No, Miles, we don't know what you're saying. That was a good joke. Maybe it's time to visit the UCLA bakery where European patisserie Hans Elbel and André Lemon turn up to 300 dozen cookies each and every day. Not to mention hundreds of cakes, pastries, and all kinds of delectables mm. beginning every morning in the wee wee hours. Do they bring us any? Gosh, I hope so. Hi, it's Costanza for you see the next. We're inside of the restaurant of Denev inside the campus and we are going to learn everything about the bakery. It's in the middle of the night. Let's go. I'm born in Germany and I've been here 43 years in the United States. And for how many years you work uh, in UCLA? I work at UCLA now six years. I would like to know exactly what you do because uh, we know that he's the boss. <laughs> 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 but now he's not here so you're free to say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Even if he's here. <laughs> no, I just assist him, you know. Uh, if he's not here, I take over his position. So I have my own bakery in Anaheim, California for close to 12 years when I yeah. sold it and I thought I couldn't retire but UC Irvine called me and asked me I would I want to run their bakery so I run their bakery for six six years and then UCLA called me up and say we like to have a bakery in here there was no bakery before to set it up and run it I was uh, traveling all over the world I was working in Singapore, I was working in Australia, and then I ended <laughs> in America. Living here right now, 10,000 students, residential students, and we only make for residential dining. We're shipping nothing out to any other restaurants. And everything is produced here? Everything is produced here, we buy nothing from the outside. So, Sarah Except the bread. <laughs> You 
can not feel it but with this terrible smell of butter. Same thing, it's hot. We so make most of the time breakfast items like donuts. Okay. We make uh, cakes, we make bars, everything what you need for a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The cookies are ready now, so. Cookies, we produce about two, three hundred dozen a day. We hire some people with experience and some people with not experience. Now, since we got the culinary schools here in LA, Sometimes they send people over. I really like to hire somebody and train them myself. It's very important in baking uh, that you be very precise, especially when you're on the mixer. It's not like a kitchen or a cook. A cook always can adjust his sauces and everything. With the cookies, you never can adjust it. But what uh, can they can do wrong? You can mess up the recipe or leave the stuff too long in the oven or you know, some other things you can do wrong. Now that no one see me, I will take a cookie. So it's almost a secret and we want to go to the cafeteria to see how he settles down everything. So thank you very much. And uh, when we are hungry during the night, we will come to see you. Just stop by. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, it's almost 7 o'clock, no one is here still, but I'm going to eat for first. Hmm, it's a hard choice. Okay, mm. that's where I'm taking my mm. Wednesday night girlfriend. <laughs> She's gonna love that place. I don't think it's open to the public. Oh. Well, there you go. No. Join us again for another edition of UCLA Next. <laughs> Wanna get some donuts? Mm, sure. Hey, what about me? It's not open to the public. You're, you're the public? No, we're private. See ya. Now dreams on the silver screen. I see their faces on mega.